Today I want to label my thoughts with three words. Three simple words. And if you walk away with anything today, I want you to walk away with these three words. Engrave them upon your mind and stamp them upon your heart. Live for Christ. Live for Christ is what the Christian life is all about. So today I give you three words. Live for Christ. Would you say that with me? Live for Christ. Christ. Say it one more time. Say it fast though. Live for Christ. Amen. You know, I once heard many years ago that leaders are readers. Now that does not mean every reader will eventually become a leader, but you can study the lives of successful and great leaders and you always discover that they are men or women who spend time reading on a consistent basis. They are the ones in our society or in our world that say, hey, learning is a never-ending thing and we should continue to learn our entire lives. And so I began to learn that many, many years ago and so I developed a, 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 an idea that, that I was going to read biographies on a regular basis. And one of the individuals I've been reading recently the past, really the past couple of years and studying his life was George Whitfield. George Whitfield was a man who died in his, in his 50s. Didn't live as long as uh, most people live in their lives. He was a man who lived in an age where there were no airplanes, there were no automobiles, and the way to travel was by foot, horseback, or by sailing across the seas. As you probably studied his life, he grew up in the Europe area, and he, he eventually became a Christian, and, and God put in his heart that he was just going to travel the world and share the gospel with people. He became a prominent preacher in the Europe area. He traveled and came over to the colonies and, uh, during that season of the United States and, and went all up and down the colonies. They say that, that during that time period, he met more people personally and more people saw him in person than people saw Benjamin Franklin. This man traveled all over the colonies. He went back to the, to the Europe area and he goes over there and he starts to, to preach in a, in a church there and, and, and the church that, that, he, that he left, they, they began to not like him anymore. Some of the things he was teaching and so they, they kind of kicked him underneath the bus and he goes out and he begins to preach on the streets. And he had such a booming voice that people would come for, from all over and literally on the street corners he would preach to multiple thousands of people. At times it's been reported that he preached to tens of thousands of people. He comes to the, the colonies again. He starts an orphanage, does all sorts of stuff, preaches in churches all over the colonies. And the day that he died was right after he preached a sermon. And the church that he was scheduled to preach in that, that week buried his bones and his deceased corpse underneath the pulpit. He was a man who dedicated his entire life to advancing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And today, as I look at his life, I know it's an extreme example, but I, all I see from his life is that, that he chose to live every single day for Jesus Christ. Amen. And today, it's important that we realize that, it, that, that as a Christian today, uh, whether, you're li whether you lived many years ago or you're living right now or, or you're going to live for many more days in the future, every single day of our lives is to be devoted to him and to him only. Live for Christ every day of your life. I know we, 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 we begin to get all these thoughts and ideas. We, I read all these biographies and I'm like, oh man, I wonder, wonder what it's going to be like for me in the years to come. Or, or maybe you think to yourself, I wonder what the ministry will be like for me in the years to come. And I'm here to tell you something. It all begins every day. Just give God each day and live for Him every day. So as we come to this passage... You know who's writing. The Apostle Paul is writing by the divine inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God. He never visited the city of Colossae. I found it interesting in my study that, that the city Colossae is only mentioned in these four chapters here in this book. This church was started as a direct result of his ministry. Not by his hands. It was kind of like he discipled somebody and they go and they start the work. 
And he's writing and he's developing some thoughts about Bible doctrine and about the deity of Christ and about giving Christ preeminent in your life. And, and as he comes to verses 6 and 7, uh, last week we looked in verses 1 through 5 of how and it's very important that we, that we understand and, and study Bible doctrine. And now as we come to verses 6 and 7, I believe that in the midst of this doctrinal dissertation of the, of the Apostle Paul of the church of Colossae, that, that here we have some great practical life applications that we can take and, and make a part of our lives in verses 6 and 7. You see, much of this book is all about the great doctrine and theological issues of the Christian faith, but these two verses deal with the great practical application of the Christian life. So today I have a key question I want to ask and answer. How can I live for Christ? Well, look at verse number 6. As, as we, before we move into this, I want to share with you five practical ways we can live for Christ. I'm going to share with you, first of all, live for Christ by practicing what you preach. As I read this passage, I wrote, secondly, live for Christ by being anchored in Him. I wrote down, thirdly, live for Christ by growing in Him. I wrote down, fourth of all, live for Christ by being firm in your faith. And I wrote down, fifthly, live for Christ by being thankful. Now, I move these through these pretty rapidly, so I want you to listen up and buckle your spiritual seatbelts because we're going for a ride through these two verses this morning. But look at verse 6. It says, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord. Please keep in mind, earlier in this text, in chapter 1, Paul's writing with the assistance of Timothy, and he says to the saints in verse 2 of chapter 1, and the faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae. So he's writing to all those who have trusted Christ as their Savior. There was a time in these people, and these believers' lives, where they acknowledged that they were lost, and that they were sinners, and they have come short of the glory of God and that they needed Christ as their Savior and they accepted His, his atonement on the cross, his, 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 his gruesome death 2,000 years ago. And they believed in His resurrection and how by believing on His name they can have eternal life in Him. And by the way, Jesus Christ is not a way to heaven. He is the only way to heaven. And by Him, He said He is the door. He said He is the bread of life. He said, I am the vine. You are the branches. He said He is the good shepherd and the good shepherd gives His life for the sheep. My dear friends, today I uh, just uh, traveled just uh, two-tenths of a mile right down the road to tell you today that Jesus Christ loves you and He died for you and you need to receive Him as Savior if you haven't done it already. And he's writing to these people, and he says, You have received Christ the Lord. And he writes these words Now it's time to walk ye in him. So today, here's the application live for Christ every day of your life. As I read this phrase in verse 6, I wrote down, first of all, live for Christ by practicing what you preach. Live for Christ by practicing what you preach. <laughs> Today I stand to you as a preacher. And I, I know the importance. There's times where, where I handle some of these passages or, or God lays on my heart to preach a sermon. And the one who needs a sermon the most is not the one sitting in the pew, but the one standing in the pulpit. <laughs> And so today, please rest assured that I'm a sinner just like everybody else out there, but I've been saved by God's marvelous and infinite grace. And today, I just want to encourage you and admonish you that we are called to practice what we preach. Jesus said, or in fact, the New Testament says that if you, if you go out and you preach the gospel, you need to also live the gospel, the Apostle Paul said to the church at Rome. You ever heard the saying? Actions speak louder than words. That's right. You know it. Something that my parents taught me and that their parents taught them and probably their parents taught them and their parents taught them and the same goes for you. Our actions will always speak louder than our words. So today you can, you can claim with your lips that you know Jesus Christ as Savior but I'm here to tell you something. People watch you. People watch me and we can also claim with our lifestyles that Jesus is our Savior. So I wonder today, are you practicing what you preach? I know you might, you might not be the one standing and preaching a sermon uh, like me, but, but you are preaching a sermon with your life. Amen. Are your actions speaking louder than your words? The people that you labor with in your occupation, can they tell that you are a child of the living King? Do they know by the things that you say and by the way that you act that you're saved. For those of you that are still in school, your peers, your classmates, can they tell that you're a child of God 
just by the way that you live your life. The first practical way we can live for Christ is by practicing what you preach. Are you practicing what you preach? Secondly, today, I want to move forward in our verse. Look at verse 7. The term rooted. Would you say root with me? Root. Say it one more time, please. Root. Root. Hey, Thomas, if you could just take a seat for me, that'd be great. If you could sit down right there, just somewhere in there, that'd be great. Thanks for your help. If you could just scoot over Michael, that'd be helpful. Thank you. Thanks, fellas. God bless you. Say root with me on three. One, two, three. Root. Say it again. Root. Today, as we come to this verse, as we come to this one word, I wrote down this thought. Live for Christ by being anchored in Him. Live for Christ by being anchored in Him. Have you ever been out on a boat before? Maybe on Smith Mountain Lake, maybe out on Claytor Lake, or maybe out on the, on the ocean. Well, I've been out on a boat before. The first time I went on a boat, I, I was uh, uh, younger than most of these teenagers right up here. And I, I was out on Smith Mountain Lake, and, and the guy that was driving the boat, or riding the boat, whatever it's called, uh, we were out in the boat, and they were zooming on the, on the, on the, on the, on the Smith Mountain Lake, and, and they began to, to increase the throttle. And that boat just started to kind of skip on those waves. And I thought to myself, man, this is something. This is kind of cool. But, you know, these boats have anchors. And you know what they're for? You take the anchor out, you cast it into the sea to where if... If you are kind of being stationary there, you want to kind of fish for a little while, you just anchor yourself there so you, the, the waves will come, the currents will come, and not pull you away from where your spot is. Today, as we look at the word rooted, it literally means to become stable, or in other words, to, to be anchored in the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you know Christ as Savior, your anchor is not, not necessarily in this church. Your anchor is not in the sermons that I preach. Please, please don't misunderstand that. Your anchor is not in, 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 in any, anything else but Him and Him alone, Jesus. Amen. And by the way, Jesus said that by our fruits... We'll know. He said, speaking of the false prophets, by their fruits you'll know them. I like what one preacher said. He said, whenever there's a fruit problem, there's always a root problem. Did you catch that? Whenever there's a fruit problem, there's always a root problem. So check it out now. You have, maybe some of you have gardens, maybe you have some apple trees, and there you, you know it is an apple tree by the fruit it produces. You know it's an orange tree, you know it's an avocado tree, you know it is, 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 a, is a bean plant, and man, I, I can't stand those vines. Whew, God have mercy. My back got about to kill me when my dad used to make me go out there and pick those beans. And then snapping those beans, <laughs> I'd just rather go buy the can. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. That's why God put it on these minds of men to invent grocery stores. <laughs> so you wouldn't have to do all that hard labor. Nonetheless, uh, so, so there you know what's being produced by the, 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 the fruit that's given off on those trees. And as a Christian, I wonder, the tree that you're producing, what fruit is coming off of your lifestyle? If there is a fruit problem, I'm telling you, the problem lies within the root. We have to be rooted, anchored, and settled in Jesus Christ and Him alone. Live for Christ. Live every day of your life for Him and Him alone. Uh, we noted in verse 6, live for Christ by practicing what you preach. And the, this the next verse with the term rooted, I wrote down, live for Christ by being anchored in Him. But then I wrote down thirdly, look, it says, rooted and built up in Him. Would you say built with me on three? One, two, three. Built. Say it again, please. Built. So I wrote down thirdly, live for Christ by growing in Him. Live for Christ by growing in Him. This term built, it literally means to build upon. One commentator said, this is a continual process being built up constantly like an ever-expanding building. Many years ago, God put it upon the heart of Jerry Falwell to start a Bible college. 
And ultimately in his mind, he wanted more than just a Bible college. He wanted a university for, for evangelical Christians to be able to go to so they could become a doctor, so they could become a nurse, and not just to become a, a, a pastor or a missionary. God put in his heart, and, and today as you go there, it is a whole lot different just in their facilities than it was when Brother Andrews and Miss Nancy went there. And so as you go there, they are ever expanding their facilities. They just keep growing and growing and growing. Now they just don't have a campus in the flesh. They also have a campus on the web. And now they have over 100,000 students going to school at Liberty University. They're ever expanding. And just as a university will expand continually throughout their lifetime, God desires for us as believers to expand and grow in Him spiritually. To continue. To being built up in Him. To increase in our knowledge of Christ. To, to grow in our relationship with God. I, I say this respectfully. I say this compassionately. But I also say it with great courage. That the majority of Christians today are just infants in their faith. And they are... are Way older than an infant. Today, people claim to know Christ as Savior at a young age, and they grow their entire lives without ever digging into God's Word and knowing anything about Him. You can only learn so much from a sermon. you got to dig into God's Word and let God speak to you. You can only grow so much by listening to uh, somebody like me or, or another pastor or, or another minister or a Sunday school lesson or a Bible study. you got to dig in and do the work yourself. You know how Michael Jordan got to the place that he was? It wasn't because he just uh, was, was, he came out of his mother's womb at six foot six or however tall he is with, with a jump shot that could just slice anybody's cake. You know what I'm saying? There he, he every day as a young child as a teenager. He began to shoot those free throws. He began to work on those drills. He began to work on the footwork. And then eventually at some point after the daily routine of, of working out and, and developing his craft, he got to the point that he was the superstar of the NBA. Today as a Christian, we can learn a lot about him. He continually grew as a basketball player. And today we have to continually grow as a child of God. We have to continually grow as a child of the living God. I wonder today, are you growing spiritually? Or are you decreasing spiritually? Live for Christ by practicing what you preach. Live for Christ by being anchored in Him. Live for Christ by growing in Him. But I also want to share with you as the verse moves forward, look at the words established in the faith. Would you say established with me on three? One, two, three. Established. Say it again, please. Established. As I read this word and I study this word, it literally means to be confirmed in the faith. So I wrote down this. Live for Christ by being firm in your faith. This term established, it means to be confirmed, but it also means to be to kind of be like anchored and settled as, as the term rooted and as the term steadfast over in verse number 5. And so here, it, it means to not be wavered, to be fixed, to be settled. That means when the storm comes that you're still going to be anchored, you're still going to be settled in your faith. And today we have a lot of Christians in modern Christianity that when, when the storm comes, they run away. It's kind of like the three little pigs. The story, you've heard the story. One they built with straw, and, and I don't remember all the story, but you know the one that built with, 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 with bricks, the, the wolf came and blew and didn't blow down the house. So today I wonder, when the enemy comes and starts blowing, trying to uh, blow your door down and to blow your spiritual life down, are you firm in your faith? Check out the last part of this verse. It says abounding therein with thanksgiving. How can you live for Christ? Well, you can be firm in your faith. You can grow in Him. You can be anchored in Him. You can practice what you preach. But I also want to share with you fifthly and finally. Live for Christ by being thankful. Gratitude is something that we need to practice every single day. <laughs> Somebody was telling me they saw a church sign, I think it was Miss Willie Bell, after the church on Wednesday, said she saw a church sign that said, imagine if you woke up tomorrow morning 
with everything you thank God for that day. I don't know about you, that's pretty convicting. That hit me right in the heart when she told me that last Wednesday. I wonder if you, if you right now, woke up tomorrow morning and, and had everything that you thank God for today, I wonder how much you would have. <laughs> I must confess, I wouldn't have a whole lot. Let me just tell you, and I know you wouldn't either. Because most Christians are ungrateful. We're Americans. We have everything and we expect everything else to be given to us. We are like the, quote, elite of the world, unquote. And we think that the world revolves around us, but I'm here to tell you something. The world revolves around Jesus Christ. And we need to thank Him for the life that we've been given. We need to thank Him for the eternal life that He's blessed us with. We need to thank Him for the church that we have. We need to thank Him for the, the message of salvation found in the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to thank Him for His Word. We need to thank Him for everything that we have. So today I wonder... Are you living for Christ? Are you living every day of your life for Him? There's so many people we could talk about, but the Apostle Paul is writing this letter, and he's in jail. In jail, as he's writing these believers, and he's stressing the importance of living for Christ. So I ask you five questions. Are you thankful? Are you firm in your faith? Are you growing in Christ? Are you anchored in Christ? Are you practicing what you preach? Let's live every day for the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you.